This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Today you're going to hear an amazing story of God chasing after a fugitive, not to catch him for his crimes, but to bring him back to himself. Herman Mendoza was just 12 years old when he started running with street gangs in Queens, New York. The path God used to bring this man to become a pastor is one you need to hear to believe. Was there, was there anything out there that would draw you away from the gangs at that time? I and mean, were there any programs or something like that, that that you might choose rather than choose the gangs? Was the gangs just a natural, natural place to, uh, to go? Yeah, unfortunately, there were no programs uh, readily available to the community kids. Uh, and so, you know, even though I was growing up, I was playing stickball mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, American football. Play out in the street? Uh, yeah, on the street. Mm-hmm. It was a street kind of, you know, game and other games we were engaging in. But um, there was no really, there was no program set up for the community, unfortunately. Um, so, yeah, I got, got caught up in that. So you naturally get caught up in that. What, what kind of things does that lead you into as a, as a young man then, as a preteen or a teenager? Yeah, it basically started with marijuana. I was introduced with marijuana Mm -hmm. and uh, started smoking weed, as they called it back then, and got hooked on that and was introduced to uh, hardcore drugs. I was introduced to cocaine at At, at at 12, 12, 13 years of age. Wow. And it was just readily available to you. Yeah. Some uh, kids in the the block, Mm -hmm. uh, they had access to it. Uh, This is when... Uh, the beginning of the drug cocaine uh, phenomenon that took place yep. in America through Pablo Escobar. This is like the really the beginning of it. And so mm-hmm. I was introduced and eventually got hooked uh, and started to sell small quantities just to sustain my habit. I mean, you, you go from Juvie to Rikers Island to the SHOT program to federal prison back to Rikers. That's a long circular route. I mean, up and down and in and out of in and out of jails and prisons. And, and uh, what what happened after you went to juvie? I mean, why why would that not have scared you straight? Yeah, I mean, I witnessed a friend of mine get murdered right in front of me. Ah. And um, at 13, 14 years of age, and at, at that moment, you know, it shook me a little bit, mm-hmm. right, for a day or two, and then I just went right back into the streets. Did- and so my right after I was released from uh, juvie my parents concocted a plan to send me to the Dominican Republic uh, Uh. to strain my act out and take, you know, keep me away from uh, these vices. That's what they did. They were going to send you down to your grandparents and get you straightened out and you'd come back to New York and be a a better teenager for it. What what happened in the Dominican Republic? Uh, I was a nuisance. Uh, I I caused (laughs) havoc and and turmoil uh, towards my grandparents and they had enough and they contacted my mom and said, look, we're going to send them back. What, what, uh, what, were you, what were you doing down there? I mean, your grandparents loved you. I mean, what were you doing yeah, that, yeah. that caused them to say, hey, this guy's got to go back to New York. We can't handle him. What kind of things were you getting into down there? Because the gangs weren't uh, there, right? They, they weren't there. But uh, alcohol, unfortunately, was readily available for teenagers. Uh, there's not like in the United States where there's measures in place uh, that you can't, you, know, you can't just mm-hmm. purchase alcohol underage. But in the Dominican Republic, it's just a whole different world. And... I started to drink and consume alcohol and hang around with the wrong kids. So what, what happens? You get, uh, your, your parents weren't ready for you to come back to, to New York yet, right? They weren't ready. So, <laughs> so uh, what happened when I, you came home? As I arrived, they were skeptical and uh, obviously they, they were, you know, trying to uh, see the, my next move. And mm-hmm. I went to high school and I uh, re-engaged with my girlfriend, uh, now wife, uh, mm-hmm. for 34 years. But uh, she, um, you know, I had met her in the Dominican Republic, and then I saw her in uh, a few funerals of people that were murdered in, in the community uh, that, that I knew, and I guess she heard about them through friends, and so I met her at these funerals. Were these, were these gang members that were being murdered? I mean, people that you saw people in didn't, didn't that kind of get to you and think, I don't want that life? I, I want a straight life? Yeah, uh, but at that point in high school, I wasn't in, involved in gang activities. Uh, so I was more into my working out. Mm-hmm. I was more into my girlfriend. And uh, so right out of high school, I decided to get married. And my mom was like, you're not going to college? I'm like, I'm, I'm in love. I said, I'm Latino. <laughs> we do it early. And so I got married. And this is where the, the turning point happens for me. 
Um, my second oldest brother and my fourth oldest brother were involved in the sales of narcotics, and they were involved with a uh, drug cartel out of Colombia. Had you been and involved I, in that prior to that at all, or did they had just gotten, they were much older than you? They're much older than me, yeah, mm -hmm. and they were involved in it. I knew what they were doing. I knew the, the kind of possessions that they had, uh, you know, properties and driving $140,000 vehicles. And, oh, wow. And, you know, I wasn't lured to that, but... Um, I, you know, I, I was unemployed at the time. I was laid off from my job. So you get, you get and, married right out of high school, 18, 19 years old, yeah, and you, you had a wife to support now and a family. She's, she's probably working, but exactly. what happened with your job? So I was just laid off, uh -huh. uh, unfortunately. And so I contacted my brother and I said, look, I need some money. And he goes, you want to do some work? I'm like, okay. So I went to a stash house that they had and I counted $1.2 million in cash. Holy did they, they were, did they want you to run drugs, or did they just kind of get you on the administrative side of things and keep you safe? Administrative side of things. <laughs> <laughs> so when I counted that money, there were two Mac 10s there uh, on the dresser, and two accounting machines to muffle the sound. Um, uh, I'm sorry, the TV was blasted mm -hmm. to muffle the sound of the accounting machines. And when I saw this money, I got paid like ten thousand dollars. I was like, you know what? This is easy money. Wait a minute! Wait a minute. You're you're nineteen years old, and they they paid you ten thousand dollars to run a million two through a counting machine. Yeah. And you thought this is easy money, and I don't have to be on the street taking bullets for anybody. Exactly. Holy and so wow. I engaged in the full activity of this operation, which was very sophisticated, mm -hmm. and started to uh, not just be a part of the organization, but distributing cocaine throughout the Eastern Seaboard. Uh, and I got arrested a few years later. Um, you know, I thought I was on top of the world, spending sure. all this money, you know, going to different clubs, having all this possession, millions of dollars passing through my hands. And the, uh, one day I get arrested with 31 kilos of cocaine, 25 kilos, oh. kilograms in my, the trunk of my vehicle another six kilos in a stash house. Handling cocaine in the middle, like distribution, I mean, you've got the police on one side, you've got the Colombian cartel on the other side. You are in a, you're in a pressure cooker there as far as somebody not liking you and taking you out. Oh, yeah. No, it's a, it's a different... That is it was scary. A very, yeah. yeah, it was very scary for her. Uh, and she talks about it, too, and we, talk, we describe it in the book. Um, and uh, so that, at that point, when I was arrested, the very next day, I read the newspaper... And it said two brothers arrested with $3.8 million uh, worth of cocaine uh, and facing life in prison. Now, Mayor Giuliani was mm -hmm. governing the city at the time. He was a, he was a law and order mayor, too. He, he was, was a law and order tough mayor, guy. definitely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so in the paper, uh, as I was reading, it said these brothers are confronting life in prison. Uh, and, you know, I had my wife and I had one child at the time. And really, that, that shook me, but we had attorneys in place. And the only thing, the only thing I was thinking about was really about myself mm -hmm. and how, to, how I get out of jail. Uh, I wasn't thinking about anything else. I was thinking about how do I get out of jail? Um, and so we hired these attorneys that we, you know, we've used in the past. And um, uh, I, I was remanded back to prison. Uh, they didn't give us bail, and, but we copped the plea. Uh, for three to nine years of incarceration, and my brother got four to twelve. Uh, then I was sent to uh, uh, Rikers Island, and then eventually to a, a prison in upstate New York. How long were you at Rikers the first time? I was uh, waiting for the outcome of my case. I was there for about three months, and then I was another six months in uh, a Queens House, Queens House of Detention Center. Just for people who don't know, I mean, we've we've heard about Rikers Island on. TV shows and things like that. Is it, it I mean, you, you see a, an attorney go into Rikers Island and question somebody or whatever. What's it really like when somebody, get, I mean, somebody your age gets thrown in amongst that population? Uh, I'd say it, it is a, a very uh, difficult uh, jail. Um, at, back in those days, um, you know, Rikers Island was known for homicides and killing and stabbings, and, and there were a number of gangs. Uh, present there, the, the, the Crips and uh, Nietas and Bloods and Latin Kings and all these uh, gangs. Um, now, just for your viewers, uh, Rikers Island has 10 jails. Yeah, we would think of Rikers prison, Island as a jail, but it's a really, it's a big complex, isn't it? It's, it's a big complex. We, we have 10 jails and, and it houses over 14,000.
thousand inmates. Oh my goodness! So it's it's basically a city, all out of New York uh, City. Yeah, uh, uh, an, an island, um, obviously surrounded by the East River, uh, and with thousands of inmates in ten jails. Uh, so it's it was re a very difficult environment. You got that opportunity for shot, which is really kind of like a, a first offender, uh, early out kind exactly. of thing. But you have to really maintain yeah. yourself, right? Tell us, oh, about, yeah. tell us about shot because this is oh. not this is not an easy passage out of jail. It's not uh, the regimen that they have there. It's really intense. Uh, they have uh, physical exercises uh, early in the morning, five o'clock in the morning. You have ex Marines <laughs> on your face. You know. <laughs> Give me a thousand push-ups, you know, uh, you know, all these uh, things that they were doing and like uh, boot camp. Exactly. Yeah. It's sort of boot camp. And uh, so I said, look, I'm, I'm going to take this this program. But I remember the first week uh, as I arrived at the shock program, I went to a chapel. Uh, again, I was brought up in, you know, the Catholic uh, teachings, but uh, I didn't really know about God. I didn't know about Jesus. I didn't have a a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, a born again experience, and so I went there more to kind of negotiate with God. And I <laughs> you said, "You knew there was a God, and if He's there, I want exactly. Him to listen to me." <laughs> yeah, and I said, "If you allow me to pass this this program, I promise you, I'm not going to drink alcohol for six months." Oh, what a deal! <laughs> what a deal! <laughs> what a deal! For you God. work for me, exactly. You work for me, I work for you. But that's and, that's the kind of negotiation you were you were used to as a drug lord, right? If yes. Somebody does something for you, I'll do something for you, and this quid pro quo kind of thing. Exactly, exactly. A barter, bartering with God, you know, and, and and you know, you see this a lot in the drug cartel world. They ha they actually pray to, they call it in Spanish santerias, uh, sorcery, and uh, you know to saints, and and they pray and they say. You know, let this uh, ton of cocaine get through the borders, uh, stuff like that. So, you know, I was familiar with that, you know, know so I was trying. Yeah. They yeah. know there's a spiritual world. Exactly. Yeah. How did you how did you feel about yourself when you graduated from shot? Because this is a this is a tough, tough thing, tough place. You're dealing with tough guys, ex-Marines. How did you feel about yourself? Do you feel like, hey, this is a fresh new start in life or now I'm just free and I'm going to go do what I want? You know, I thought that I had the fresh start. Uh, I, I guess that's what your, your first impression. You know, that's the first thing you think about. Uh, but once you're in the streets uh, and you're back into that kind of environment, it takes a different, uh, you know, kind of uh, strength, right? And, mm -hmm. and I didn't know the Lord uh, to really combat those kinds of temptations. Um, and so during those six months, I was trying to keep straight. Not and, drinking. Uh, not drinking. <laughs> Ignorance on my part, yeah. you know, to try to make to negotiate with God. And so I, I went to this uh, a restaurant uh, with a friend, and lo and behold, I run into an old acquaintance. And uh, he was now second in command of a particular cartel out of Colombia. Uh, and he said, look, he noticed me. And he said, when did you get out of jail? And I told him recently. And he said, look, I'm controlling over a ton of cocaine. You want to get involved? Again, in this operation, you let me know. So, so Satan's out there. I mean, he knows that you're susceptible. I mean, Satan's out there, and he's, he's oh, yeah. got his hooks in you again, and he just puts that in front of you. Exactly. Of, and he's going to set you up with a ton of cocaine. Yeah, he says, I, I have that available. He says, whatever you need, I can make that uh, available for you. You know, 9 kilos, 10 kilos, 20 kilos, whatever you need. So I was dealing with my conscience and my heart and my mind was racing, thinking, what should I do, right? It's a lot of money. And I was thinking about the, also the jail time, but, uh, you know, I gave in. And, and Proverbs 26, 11 says, a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats their folly. And that's what I did. I repeated the same behaviors, the same sin. And I went back into the sale of narcotics. And I received uh, nine kilos of cocaine. I started to distribute it once again. And you, you thought that uh, this time I could be smart enough to outsmart the law. I can be cool enough that I can get by with this. But eventually, you and your brother got nailed again in a big takedown, right? Oh, yeah. So this time, uh, my, my other brother that uh, was out free, we get arrested on a federal indictment. Uh, uh, from one of his clients that was working for the DEA. And this particular client my brother had used in the past where 
they had secret compartments in the trailer where they were housed the narcotics. It's called traps. Mm -hmm. um, and they would tra you know, we would transport that drug or those kilograms from state to state. Um, and uh, this individual was working for the DA. And he, 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 has, he gave my brother and, and myself uh, to the police, to the DA. And we were uh, eventually apprehended. And that was, you talk about federal crime here, you're talking about a, a, a big indictment in this case. I mean, yeah. this was not, this was not petty, petty drug dealing. This was a big no. indictment. Every time I see the indictment, I still have the indictment. Every time I look at it and I look at what God has done in my life and I say, oh Lord, you are amazing. You could have because gone, you could have gone to, the, to, you could still be in prison. You could have gone for life. Yes. Right? Oh yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I want to I want to get back to that because big miracles begin to happen in prison, and I want to, I want to talk about that. But the, again, the book again by Herman Mendoza, Shifting Shadows, How a New York Drug Lord Found Freedom in the Last Place He Expected That. And we're going to talk about that freedom that you eventually found. We'll be right back after this. As the climate in our world grows more hostile toward our Christian worldview, Viewpoint is a program designed to help defend our faith. Each week, Bob Placey interviews guests who bring the Bible into focus. And we can be salt and light in this culture. Every description of Babylon in this book is going to come to pass. Helping us understand how relevant God's Word is for today. Viewpoint is completely viewer supported. If you've enjoyed and benefited from our interviews, we would ask you to consider helping us by supporting it financially. Your 20, 50, or even $100 monthly gift will help us continue to bring you more of these programs. Go to WTLW.com now and click Get Involved, or you can send a check to the address on your screen. Thank you for supporting Viewpoint. Viewpoint with Bob Lacey is now available as a podcast. Download your favorite podcast app like iTunes, Google Play, or Spotify and search for Viewpoint with Bob Lacey. Subscribe and listen as we discuss these important topics each week. Herman's story is one of God's grace. In just a minute, you will hear how God redeemed him through circumstances you won't believe. If there's someone you love who you believe that God could never reach, you need to stay right where you are for the conclusion of my interview with Herman Mendoza. When we went to break, uh, Herman, you were talking about uh, you, you were facing a huge federal indictment, but there was a, basically a miracle here. You, you got out on bail because of it. I mean, it was, it was, you had to raise a lot of money. <laughs> Yeah, a half a million dollars. Uh, and um, so I was out on bail and a half a million dollars. And, but your brother you know, was still your brother was still in, right? Still in. Still in. And uh, I had no contact with him, no contact with my family, really, uh, because eventually I decided to jump bail. Wow. And you're going to jump a half a million dollars. Half a million dollars. Not to. Be a lot of people looking for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and not to report to the court, you know? Yeah. And so. So what, what happened? Then you jumped bail. Uh, how, long were you, how long were you on the run? I was on the run for about three months. Mm -hmm. I was out for six, but I was on the run for about three months. And um, so one night after partying, I told my driver, take me to my, my home. I wanted to see my wife and my children. And I lived in a, a gated community. And as I arrived, the very next day, my wife picks up the phone set. And it was the police. And they said, we have the house surrounded. Oh. Tell your husband to give himself in. Uh, the very first reaction was to jump out the window. But when I realized that the state police, marshals, DEA had my house around there, I couldn't go nowhere. So I looked at my wife and I said, look, my life is over. Open the door. Oh. And so they arrested me and they took me uh, to the adjacent vehicle. And they, um, you know, hauled me to the federal prison. On the way there, I told the driver, the marshals, open the door. I want to end my life. Um, Little did I know that my brother, uh, in, uh, while he was in federal prison, he surrendered his life to Christ. And he was praying for me. And he prayed and he said, God, send my brother to the same facility, same housing unit, so I could share the gospel with him. Because if not, they're going to kill him. And I want him to know you, Lord. And God would have it no other way. 
they extradited me to New York, and I arrived at the same facility, same dormitory, same prison cell, and my brother greeted me, and he raises his hands. He said, praise the Lord, answered prayer. And I look at him, and I said, what? Praise <laughs> the Lord? Praise God? I said, brother, we're in jail. What are you talking about? And he goes, you'll get it. You know, God, God will you know, take a hold of your heart. So, so he how did, a different man. How did all that happen with him? I mean, he was a, he was a pretty high up in the, in the drug cartels as well. How did, how did that happen to him that he's in prison, he finds Christ, begins to pray that you get returned to prison so that you can find yeah. Christ? <laughs> it's, it's totally a miracle. Uh, he was attending a chapel service within the dormitory where he was housed, and it was being run by inmates. And so every day, a jailhouse preacher will uh, deliver a sermon. And my brother was facing life in prison as well. And so he decided to attend. And God got a hold of his heart. Wow. And he surrendered his life to Christ. And then he, he, he talks. I mean, you're, you're here and you're, in, in, you're not going to see your family again. You're facing possibly life. Depression sets in. You think, I want to end my life. You try to jump out of a car. You think about jumping out of a car. You start realizing how hopeless your life really is is that the only is that why you went to the chapel service that night i just wanted peace i was depressed i was in a confined uh housing unit federal prison um and there was recourse i'm like what sh what i'm gonna you know what should i do with my life and my brother said you i want you to come to the chapel service and i went and the preacher was sharing the same thoughts that i was running through my mind and I knew it was for me. And God brought this sense of conviction on my heart that I was a sinner and needed this peace that's, that, that he talks about that surpasses all understanding. So I approached the jailhouse preacher and I said, this is me towards the end of the service. And I started to cry. And I felt this warmth that enveloped me. I felt you know, the presence of God. And I felt so convicted that it wasn't about me, but it was about the folks that I've harmed, like my mom, my children, and even those that I was uh, harming that I didn't even know by the drugs that I was spewing out into society. Uh, and so I wanted to make amends. I wanted to make it right. Uh, and God did miracles in that prison. I started to immense myself in scripture, you know, and make phone calls and call my mom, and, you know, ask for forgiveness. And she said, she was skeptical, yeah. but she said, uh, you know, you're my son and, I, you know, I'm really happy for you. And I tried to reach my wife and I couldn't reach her. Um, and um, so I started to uh, apply for uh, different Bible institutes. Uh, one in particular was with the Assemblies of God. And I started to study the Word of God, theology, uh, and educate myself in law. And I became sort of like a paralegal in the prison system and helping other inmates with their cases and also with the Word of God. And so my brother and I took over this chapel, and we became the, the pastors, um, mm -hmm. jailhouse pastors, and we started pastoring hundreds of inmates that today, uh, this particular uh, chapel, Five North, is still being run by inmates, and it's a miracle uh, wow. in itself. I mean, te and, yeah, you know, teaching, teaching inmates to read by, by reading the Bible and, and all types exactly. of ministering and counseling. Tell us what happened with your wife. This is another big miracle. I mean, because it came out of fasting and prayer. Yes. After three days of fasting and prayer, you know, and asking God for her salvation, I said, Lord, even though she may not come back to me as my wife, what I want is for her to know you, Lord. And I fasted for three days, no water, no food. And that week, as we finished our fast with another inmate, uh, I, I, I received a, a visit, and when I went down to the visiting area, it was my wife, and she said, I have bad news to share with you, and I said to her, give me a moment, I have good news to share with you, <laughs> and I just started to pour my heart out to her and share this new transformation that God saved me, that God redeemed me, that God restored my life, and that I wanted for her to experience this. And she started to cry, and she started to share her faults, and we started to share our faults, you know, together, as the scripture says in, in James, to confess our sins to one another. Mm -hmm. God began to bring healing and restoration to that marriage. And she said, 
I want the Jesus that you serve wow. because you're more free in prison than myself that I'm out in society. And I led her to the Lord uh, and, and she received Christ in her heart and her life was forever changed. What a miracle. But you're still yes. in prison. She's outside. I mean, you're both saved. You're both going to live for Christ. Did you begin to pray that somehow God would reunite you and, and bring your family back together, that you could get out of prison earlier? Yes, I did. I, I, I prayed for that, but I said, Lord, your will be done. I know you, I was so uh, in tune to the, the Spirit of God, uh, the, the spiritual connection I was having with the, with the Lord, the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so God began to really use us in prison until the day came for my sentencing, and I was yeah, sentenced. That was another miracle, because you're going before a judge to be sentenced for this horrendous indictment, and you've got a district attorney, a prosecuting attorney, who's supposed yeah. to be asking for the, throw the book at you, because this guy's a drug lord, he's ruined a lot of lives, and he tells the, ju he tells the judge that you've done some great things in prison, and I hope he continues to do a lot of these things when he gets out of prison. That in itself is a miracle. That, that was definitely a miracle. I, I, I was uh, elated, obviously. I was in shock for the response from this prosecutor. So the day came for my release, and I was rearrested by the state parole. Wait a minute. The, you, you're, going, you're going to be released from federal prison, and the state parole, p patrol shows up and says, we've got a warrant for your arrest. And I'm like, okay, Lord, you want me back in the city jail? And I said, use me, Lord. And so I was transported to Rikers Island. Back to Rikers. Jail. Back to Rikers. Back to Rikers. <laughs> Eventually, God used me there for the three months I was in Rikers Island. And a judicial judge read my case and said, I'm going to restore you back in, into society because you've done a, a miraculous things in prison um, and, and you need to be released. And so I was released and I started an organization working with young people and I started to work for my attorneys as a paralegal. Herman, it's an amazing story. It's shifting shadows, and it's how Herman M Mendoza, he was a drug lord up and down the East Coast of the United States, involved with Colombian cartels, and yet Jesus Christ found him in the midst of a prison and redeemed his life, yeah. and now he's doing the same thing for others. Herman, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. You can get Herman's book, Shifting Shadows, on Amazon. And if you want to know more about Jesus Christ, you can find out more on our website at WTLW.com. Thank you for watching. Remember, you can watch the interviews you've seen today on demand on YouTube. Plus, you can also listen to all of our episodes on The Viewpoint with Bob Placey podcast on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere you listen to a podcast.